Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to uh, CIC National Capital Branches event, The Costs and Challenges of Corruption in International Affairs. Uh, bonsoir, le les chapitre de la Capitale Nationale du CIC présente coûts et défis de la corruption dans les affaires internationales. My name is Randolph Harold. I'm the uh, Vice President of the National Capital Branch, sitting in for David Dement, our President, who is in Toronto tonight, attending a very important CIC fundraiser there. So we wish him luck. <clears throat> uh, this is National Capital Branch's third foray into international corruption. Well, I don't mean that literally, but <laughs> the first was in uh, 2012 in international sport when we were privileged to have an award-winning investigative journalist, Declan Hill, present the story behind his international bestseller, The Fix, a controversial expose of match fixing in professional soccer. It resulted in prosecutions in 22 countries. And at the same time, we had Canada's Dick Pound, who many of you will know, Olympic medalist and Olympic committee member who has famously expanded and enhanced the work of the World Anti-Doping Agency based in Montreal. And he recounted for us many of the struggles he has had to keep top level international sport clean. Last May, we had an excellent presentation by George Hainel, former vice president of Bombardier and well-known diplomat who addressed the challenges to corporate statecraft internationally, of which there are many, and equally from Helle Bank Jorgensen, who heads the UN Global Compact in Canada, an organization promoting rules-based, internationally socially responsible business ethics. But before we begin tonight's program, I want to let you know about CIC National Capital Branch's upcoming events. On April 28th, our Asia Pacific Study Group will host uh, a breakfast for uh, Stephen Groff, Vice President of the Asian Development Bank here at the Sheraton. On May 15th, in the Rideau Room right here, we will host Dr. Joseph Jaffe on the myth of America's decline. He is one of Europe's outstanding public intellectuals, a visiting professor at Stanford University and editor of the prestigious German weekly magazine Die Zeit. He has lectured at Harvard, Princeton and the University of Munich. Dr. Jaffe will be addressing the theme of his provocative new book, The Myth of the American Decline in which he challenges the view that the U.S. is a declining superpower whose economic and military strength will be outstripped before long by China. The book has touched off a lively debate south of the border, and David Halton, formerly of CBC and now a branch board member, will MC the event, so it should be very interesting. On June 17th, the Right Honourable Joe Clark, former Prime Minister, who laments for Canada but is still pitching hope, will grace our podium with How We Lead, Canada in a Century of Change, his book, and will add updates and commentary on current issues, which should be very interesting. Please join us for these events. You're all invited. By the way, you can catch up on some of our past presentations and much more by way of debates and blogs on current issues on CIC's national website, opencanada.org. Go to branches slash Ottawa National Capital for our complete story. Tonight's event will be available there shortly via YouTube. We're ha we have video filming of it uh, tonight. And for the 30-somethings in the crowd, you can join us uh, in tonight's debate on Twitter 
Um, there is uh, the hashtag is uh, CIC corruption. That's easy to remember. <laughs> and our, our normal uh, 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 Twitter sphere address is tweet at CIC Ottawa. And uh, there you go. So uh, a special thank you tonight to our in-kind sponsor, Av Canada, Audiovisual Canada, for their new support. They've been providing excellent technical support to our events for a number of years and are now a sponsor. And now on with the show, the costs and challenges of corruption in international affairs. Is corruption driving the proliferation of civil conflicts and the rise of fundamentalist movements? Are international affairs driven more by theft and plunder than ideology and identity? And what can Canada do to ensure transparency, accountability, and legality? CIC is very privileged to have two leading figures engaged with these issues. Akash Maharaj, the executive director of the Global Organization of Parliamentarians Against Corruption, an international network of parliamentarians dedicated to good governance through global pressure and national action. Akash has been involved in advancing the public good through his professional and voluntary life. He is a frequent contributor to international debate his articles have been published in newspapers across the world. He has served as a regular broadcast essayist with TV Ontario, and Maclean's magazine named him one of Canada's 50 most well-known and respected personalities. An active athlete, he captains Canada's national equestrian, equestrian skill at arms team, was a triple gold medalist at the international championships, and served as the 2008 to 2012 professional head of Canada's Olympic and Paralympic equestrian team. He earned his MA in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University, where he was the first overseas student elected president of the university's student government. And I also understand you were the first overseas student to be the head of the Oxford debating team. Is that right? Not the debating team. Not the debating team. Okay. <laughs> he has been decorated twice in Canada's national honors for services to international peace and for services to the integrity of sport. He's fluent in English and French. And you can reach him on his personal website, Practical Idealism. Susan Carter is a director of Transparency International Canada and a former associate director of the Canadian Council on Social Development. Susan Carter has a background in public policy and in the nonprofit sector. She has worked in these areas as a manager, a researcher, an advisor, and as a teacher. Previously, she had a career in the federal public service, holding senior positions in several departments in the fields of social policy federal provincial territorial relations, equity and stakeholder relations, corporate development and change management. Ms. Carter was associate director of the Canadian Council on Social Development, a nonprofit social research organization. In 2000, she became executive director of the Voluntary Sector Secretariat of the Voluntary Sector Initiative. Editor of the Philanthropist Journal for two years, she is now a consultant researching and teaching the development of public policies and the relationship between the nonprofit sector and governments. Please welcome Susan Carter. Thank you. Thank you, Randall. Um, corruption and in international affairs, it's a vast subject with many layers and dimensions. 
I'm on the board of Transparency International Canada, which is the Canadian chapter of TI, uh, which is a global organization based in, with its headquarters in Geneva, dedicated to combating corruption. There are 99 national chapters now um, of, of this global network. And it's one of the global networks in the field of anti-corruption. We're going to hear later about some of what uh, GOPEC is doing as another uh, international network. I'm going to take a brief overview of the comparative levels of corruption in different countries and sectors and some of the measures being used to track this, as well as some of the tools and reports that Transparency International has developed to monitor and measure. Most of what I'm going to be saying draws on recent publications by Transparency International. When we talk about corruption at the international level, we often hear of the need to address the demand side as well as the supply side. Demand for bribes by governments or officials or companies, and the supply side being those who pay the bribes, whatever form these take. Companies suspected of paying bribes will talk about the need to curb the demand for bribes. However, the capacity to tackle corruption and the resolve to do so is largely limited to those countries with legal and political infrastructure along with the political will to address these issues. So, it, so the focus of efforts continues to be on the bribe payers. It's the payers who face sanctions in the countries of origin and in the international institutions which levy penalties. Corruption can occur domestically in the public sector or the private sector, or it can occur abroad between home players and public officials or the private sector abroad. It takes many forms and there are many debates and disagreements about what constitutes corruption. There was an academic um, uh, just a last month who got a lot of airtime with his uh, findings demonstrating that there was infinitely more corruption occurring in European countries than anywhere else in the world. And it turned out that he reached this conclusion largely by looking primarily at issues of tax avoidance and tax evasion as forms of corruption. Uh, not wanting to get into this debate, it's, I think it's more useful to talk about the most commonly understood and recognized forms of corruption, namely bribery and collusion under any one of a number of names. There are a number of framework agreements developed to combat corruption, um, multilateral agreements and conventions, most notably the UN Convention Against Corruption, ratified by 154 countries, which includes provision for both preventive measures and the criminalization of a wide range of corrupt acts, including the bribery of foreign public officials. Another important agreement is the OECD Convention on Combating Foreign Bribery. It produces an annual progress report that assesses enforcement of the OECD Convention on Combating Foreign Bribery. The 34 OECD countries, plus four others, are divided into four categories depending on how vigorously they're enforcing anti-bribery laws through such measures as numbers of investigations, cases commenced, and convictions. And we'll have a look at some of those findings in a few minutes. Then there are also a lot of, uh, or a number of regional agreements, such as the European Convention and the Intra-American uh, Agreement developed with the, through the OAS. And all of these agreements are the subject of regular monitoring and assessment. So what are some of the major findings from these, uh, from these assessments and monitoring? The UN Convention is monitored with annual reports based on input from non-governmental organizations that track country progress according to an index of good practices and good laws. The latest report from Canada under the Convention makes a number of recommendations. Uh, the, it makes a number of recommendations for what Canada should do to move into greater compliance with the, with the convention. And these include recommendations for um, enforcement by federal and provincial governments, particularly the enforcement of domestic uh, 
corruption, mandatory reporting by resource companies of all payments abroad, more legal channels to pursue wrongdoing, disclosure of ownership provisions, disclosure of assets during terms of office, and protection of whistleblowers. Uh, the disclosure of assets, by the way, is something that would build on what's already in place, that disclosure uh, of assets when someone takes office would then be measured against a mandatory disclosure of assets when they leave office to obviously see what happened in between. And I've got a few, of, a few charts that to, uh, to, to share. The report produced for the OECD measures progress in anti-corruption enforcement in the categories of active, moderate, limited, or very little. And we can see Canada falls in the third category, which is the limited category. At the top of the list, in terms of the highest level of enforcement by far, is the United States. It's quite remarkable what they, what's been going on there. And a lot of people have suggested that there may be <coughs> the future, <coughs> excuse me, future studies may look at what has been going on in the province of Quebec, and that might even make a difference in terms of some of uh, Canada's numbers. Um, it's interesting to note that there was a drop in the level of enforcement in many countries over the 2009-2012 period, a drop attributed most commonly to the recession. At least it coincided with the recession. Uh, theories include a drop in the standards being applied due to external stresses or attention to other priorities. However, those levels have returned to where they were previously. And it's, it's a little hard to see this, I apologize. It's, but the countries, the four most rigorous countries in enforcement, USA, Germany, UK, and Switzerland, and then in the moderate category, we have Italy, <coughs> Australia, Austria, and Finland. Limited is France, Canada, uh, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Hungary, South Africa, Argentina, Portugal, and Bulgaria. And then you get into the list of those where there's very little enforcement of any sort. From a different perspective, TI, uh, Transparency International, reports on a number of independent measures, best known as the Bribe Takers Index, which measures the likelihood or frequency of firms from a given country engaging in bribery. It includes 28 countries with the largest economies. Business executives were asked for each of the 28 countries where they have a business relationship as a supplier, a client, a partner, a competitor, how often do firms headquartered in that country engage in bribery in this country where you are? A score of 10 corresponds with the view that they never do, and zero corresponds with the view that they always do. So uh, again, at the, uh, at the very top, I don't know, that's, at, the, at the, uh, the, the cleanest, if you like, the cleanest government, the perception of the cleanest country is the Netherlands and the, the worst is China. Canada is in sixth place, tied with Australia. But the bribe payers index also measures the likelihood of engaging in bribery by business sector, uh, where 10 corresponds again to a view that they always bribe and zero corresponds to a view that they never do. When you take these two measures together, it's interesting to see some clear relationships that emerge in terms of the paying of bribes. One of the findings was that there's clear evidence of bribery between private companies and that this is just as widespread as between firms and public officials across the board. 
there are definite links between the behavior of firms and the perception of business integrity in their home country. And I think this is one of the most interesting and in a way promising findings because it suggests that the tone that's set at home can make a very large difference in the behavior of, of firms elsewhere. Similarly, there's a clear link between the livelihood, between the likelihood rather, of offering bribes and perceptions of corruption in the public sector of the home country. In other words, if there's a view that the public sector in the home country is pretty corrupt, then there's a view that this is acceptable and, and, and behavior will follow. Companies from China and Russia are viewed as the most likely to pay bribes. And finally, bribes, bribery was found across all business sectors, but the most common and widespread were public works contracts and the construction sector. And I think this, this probably corresponds to sort of a common understanding that many would have. An additional but separate measure is TI's Corruption Perception Index that measures perceived levels of public sector corruption in countries worldwide. Now, this is, this is, really, hard to, this is really hard to see up there, but I can tell you that um, Canada, in this case, is in ninth position. And um, with Denmark, Finland, New Zealand, um, and a number of other countries up ahead. Based on expert opinions, the, com the countries are scored from zero to 100. Some countries score well, but none scores a perfect 100. Two thirds of the countries score below 50, indicating serious corruption problems. And it's interesting to see the alignment that there is between this measure and the level of enforcement found among the OECD countries. So what is being done or should be done to make improvements and move ahead? The first list here are steps that can and should be taken in all countries to combat corruption. Um, the first is legislation, clearly, which criminalizes certain activities or ensures protection in other cases. And then the second is enforcement um, at all levels from detection to prosecution. It's important for governments to establish a high standard of equitable and ethical public service to be clean and to be seen to be clean. And which is widely struggled with, particularly in the field of procurement. There are many tools and tips and good practices. There have been guides that have been developed. There's a compli the compliance checklists for companies to use. There are lots of frameworks to assist companies in particular and public sectors in terms of um, s staying on the straight and narrow. But also citizens' demands for accountability and transparency. We've seen recently um, citizens in the streets in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Thailand, demanding an end to corruption because there's a, a widespread sense that they are, the entire population is suffering as a result. And finally, shining the light on performance and the ranking of countries and the discovery of corruption and bribery wherever it occurs. The second list are some, uh, are some specific recommendations directed towards authorities in Canada. And these recommendations come out of the report around the UN Convention. In the first place, federal and provincial governments need to ensure d that domestic corruption is a focus of law enforcement. Because there, there is no um, comparable legislative framework to, to make that happen. There are recommendations about the mandatory disclosure of all payments by resource companies operating abroad. Um, the, the government, the current government announced that they were going to move in terms of mandatory reporting uh, 
but there's a lot of discussion going on now through consultations about what the threshold for that, for who should be covered by that mandatory reporting. Introducing civil avenues to, to pursue allegations of corruption, which would have the effect of opening up more avenues to, uh, pursue, and, uh, to pursue corruption and to challenge corruption. To address the issue of illicit enrichment, referring to it earlier, which is recommending that leaving office officials fully disclose all assets um, in a way that similar to what they had done when taking office. There's a recommendation about the mandatory disclosure of beneficial ownership by trusts and companies registered in Canada. And this is something that's being pursued and discussed, at least with the security regulators across the country. And finally, that there needs to be statutory protections for whistleblowers in, public and private, in the public and private sector, in, and ensuring that those who experience reprisals can recover damages. Now, legislation that does all of those things is in place in the United States and it's in place in the UK. But in Canada, the legislation that we have only addresses the public sector. It doesn't guarantee uh, recovering damages for reprisals, and, it, and it's overdue for its promised review, and that has been long delayed. So these are the sorts of areas that, uh, that it's recommended be pursued at the present time in Canada. And all of these are being promoted and shared by Transparency International and others. And I would just, in closing, recommend to you the TI website that has a lot of resources, some developed by Transparency International Canada, some by the national headquarters of Transparency International, and some by other national chapters. There's a lot of excellent material there. So I would urge you to drop by the website and explore it. And you can also sign up on the website to become a member, which I would also encourage you to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. It's very good to know that uh, there are so many initiatives uh, at the governmental and uh, level that uh, are in train now. Uh, I mean, even in China, if we're to, uh, you know, uh, a lot uh, is said about the situation in China. Uh, for example, in the uh, in the in a recent Economist magazine, uh, it was suggested that uh, the the hidden assets of the Politburo are in the region of seventy billion dollars which is a pretty substantial amount. And uh, a subsequent uh, follow-up in uh, The Economist magazine referred to all the costs that people are paying from the kind of crony capitalism that develops from these sorts of regimes. Um, it's interesting that uh, Xi Jinping has taken corruption as one of his major thrusts, one of his five major thrusts in his recent uh, major policy uh, statement to the, uh, to the party. So we'll see how that goes. Anyway, on with the show. Akash, uh, welcome to the podium. Thank you. Thank you my horse. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, thank, you. thank you for the very kind introduction, Randolph. La plupart de ma présentation serait en anglais. Véritablement, toute ma présentation sera en anglais. Mais si vous avez des questions, uh, s'il vous plaît, posez-les, soit en anglais, soit en français. Um, J'aurai prob probablement autant de difficultés de répondre à l'un que l'autre. Um, as Randolph began by saying, GOPAC is a, um, I'm the executive director of GOPAC. It is a nonpartisan worldwide alliance of parliamentarians, uh, current and, and former parliamentarians, 
who have come together to work with one another across borders to combat corruption. Um, if none of, I'm sure no one in this room is so um, intemperate as to say what is actually on your minds, but I will say it for you. Virtually everyone who I have told um, that I work, told the name of the organization I work for usually says something to the effect is, isn't parliamentarians against corruption a contradiction in terms? <laughs> it is sometimes, but not always. Um, the members of GOPAC have come together for, to fight corruption by partly working with one another to create international instruments and domestic laws to criminalize, halt, and prosecute corruption, to impose de uh, effective democratic oversight over the executive branch of government, to sustain public transparency, and perhaps most importantly, to foster a culture of integrity in public life. It is a difficult and uphill battle, but it is no less important because of that. Perhaps most importantly, GOPAC acts as a peer support network for, uh, to support parliamentarians who choose to stand up and speak truth to power, especially in countries where doing so is a dangerous or an isolating choice. We have uh, 50 national chapters across the world and uh, individual members in most countries of the world. And our regional activities are grouped into six regional uh, chapters in, um, in Africa, the Arab states, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Latin America, and Oceania. We were founded actually in Canada 12 years ago as a result of a global coming together of parliamentarians in Ottawa, and our global secretariat has remained here ever since. We are, as um, Susan mentioned, part of a web of international organizations in the United Nations, in interparliamentary groups, in law enforcement, and in NGOs who work with one another to thwart transnational corruption. And I think I should begin firstly by saying a bit about the scale of corruption and what it is we are all trying to fight, all of us in this room and all of us who are part of the anti-corruption community. When we talk about corruption, it's easy to think about the, um, the police officer who asked for a bribe, the construction company that is fixing contracts, but the scale of corruption around the world almost defies understanding. The UNDP estimates that the developing world loses $10 through corruption for every dollar that it gains through international aid. In other words, we could eliminate all of the international aid and still be ahead if we could only reduce corruption by 10%. Um, the World Bank estimates that the world loses every year a trillion dollars through bribes paid often through the collusion of public actors. Uh, the UNODC estimates that the world loses about $2.1 trillion a year through the illicit movement of um, stolen and illegal cash across borders. And the Tax Justice Network estimates that the world loses about $3.1 trillion every year through large-scale tax evasion. $6.2 billion, what does that mean? That is, to all intents and purposes, an incomprehensible amount of money. But to put it into context, um, I'm sure all of you have heard about the UN Millennium Development Goals. They are wide-ranging, they are hugely ambitious, They've been largely unfulfilled, but they include ending extreme hunger and poverty everywhere in the world. That is, um, creating uh, circumstances and, and institutions so that no one in the world ever starves to death again. Providing universal primary education, promoting gender equity in, in, the, in education and in the workforce, reducing child mortality by two thirds, uh, reducing maternity, maternal mortality by three quarters, halting the spread of HIV and malaria, promoting environmental sustainability, and cutting the proportion of people who do not have access to clean water or sanitation in half. And this was, these were uh, objectives to be reached by 2015. We will not get there. But the estimated cost of achieving all of these objectives is less than half a trillion dollars. To put it into context, what the world loses every year to corruption could achieve all of these objectives 12 times over. The, what corruption is costing us is more, more than just lost efficiency, it's more than lost wealth. It is quite literally costing us the opportunity to have a better world, to create a society and lives which would have been a fantasy for our ancestors, indeed a fantasy for our contemporaries. And we could do all these things, we could defeat the most ancient enemies of the human race 12 times over for what we lose to corruption in a single year. Beyond the cash, though, is the question of 
what, what corruption does to public confidence, public institutions, and to the way we relate to one another as individuals in society. Um, the Arab Spring revolutions that, hap that swept across the Arab world were often portrayed as revolutions against tyranny, and in large measure they were. But beyond that, I would say they were largely revolutions against corruption. As harsh as it may sound, people had become accustomed to their change. They'd become accustomed to political oppression. They didn't like it and they didn't deserve it. But what I believe pushed people over the edge in Tunisia and then over the edge in many other countries was the understanding that their wealth was being stolen from them, that they had young, well-educated societies where there was absolutely no chance that they or their children were going to prosper because opportunities were being stolen from them. The BBC, until quite recently, did a worldwide survey of what were the most discussed subjects in the world. Um, the single most discussed subject on the planet across all religions, languages, continents, political systems um, was corruption of every year that the, the survey was conducted. And corruption is in effect causing a crisis of confidence in democracy itself. Since the collapse of communism, the greatest threat to democracy in my view has not been competing ideologies of political, uh, political tyranny but instead the far more insidious tyranny of political corruption. Everyone in the world claims to be a Democrat, especially people whose only interest in democracy is using elections to validate their ability to steal from their, their populations. And as people lose faith in the democratic process and in democratic institutions, um, we make a mistake to believe that, that democracy has won. Democracy has won an opportunity but if people come to believe, as they have already come to believe in many parts of the world, that democracy cannot deliver the goods because the goods are being stolen by the people who are elected to protect us and to serve us, then people start looking for alternatives to democracy, like fundamentalism and like new ideologies of tyranny. So the question, I suppose, then, is what are we doing about it? I'm going to talk about three broad activities that go back and our worldwide alliance of parliamentarians are doing to fight corruption. The first is upholding and extending the rule of law both domestically and internationally, not just to criminalize corrupt behavior, but even more importantly, to enforce those laws that are already on the books. Secondly, some of our work in strengthening parliamentary democracy. And thirdly, our work in trying to pursue and bring to justice some of the most corrupt people in the world people whose acts of, of corruption kill tens or hundreds of thousands of people. The first on the rule of law. Um, we have two um, global task forces, one on, on anti-money laundering and one on the UN Convention Against Corruption, um, which works on both uh, helping parliamentarians either to pass and implement national laws on things like thwarting bank, ending banking secrecy, um, thwarting, uh, thwarting money laundering, um, ending tax evasion, but also work with our, with our members across the wor world in trying to end these activities as they cross borders. Again, to put it into context, the UN UNDP estimates now that money laundering is the third largest industry in the world, um, second, coming only after the energy sector and financial services. So. Large, greater than any manufacturing activity. There's more money in money laundering than in any other productive activity in the world bar financial services or, or um, energy. Um, more seriously still is the movement towards influence peddling. I've only, I have only, I'm only going to use one example here. I don't expect you to read that. But um, this is a chart that was created by one of my colleagues at GOPAC, um, Louis Moreno Ocampo, who used to be the first prosecutor for the International Criminal Court. That is the web of cor corrupt relationships in Peru linked to the Fujimori administration. And this chart was used to prosecute uh, Fujimori and his colleagues. As you can see, it is an, um, a mind-numbingly complex web of illicit relationships between political parties, government, legislators, the media, the private sector, um, the bureaucracy, and, uh, and the judiciary. Um, there are literally hundreds of lines, indeed, um, that's a simplified version, there are literally thousands of lines connecting hundreds of people in corrupt activities. These are the lines that show cash transfers between those individuals. I'll just flip between them. As you can see, the lines showing ca cash transfers 
are very, very modest. Um, in other words, although there was a massive infrastructure of corruption, very little of it actually involved cash changing hands directly from one person to another, in part because there are mechanisms to track illicit um, exchanges of cash, but it's far more difficult to track um, this, the illicit use of power and the trading of favors. So for example, a, um, a business person might offer to make a donation to a politician's political party in exchange for that politician not giving him anything directly, but ensuring that the judiciary dropped or lost the charges against that individual. Um, it is difficult to track illicit flows of finan finances because money has no nationality. It is even more difficult to track the flows of um, the, Ill the illicit use of power. And that is one of the uh, issues that we, are, that we are working, that we are working hardest against right now. The other area I mentioned was on strengthening parliaments. We have three global task forces who focus on this, on parliamentary oversight, in other words, assisting parliaments in exercising meaningful oversight and restraint of the executive branch of government, on parliamentary ethics and conduct, that is setting up systems to ensure that parliamentarians themselves observe minimum standards of conduct and are caught and punished if they do not, and finally, the uh, women in parliament to increase gender equity in parliaments around the world. Um, the reason we do this is because stronger parliaments lead unambiguously to lower corruption. Um, the reason for this is very simple to describe but sometimes difficult to believe. And that is because parliamentarians, if they have a job at all, it is to act as the sword and shield of, of democracy. Before anything else a parliamentarian does, his or her responsibility is to be the person who stands up for his or her constituents and ensures the power that is wielded in their name, the money that is collected from them and spent in their name, is wielded and spent responsibly. Um, everything else in a parliamentarian's life, the uh, ad public advocacy, passing laws, turning up and voting in the commons, all that is secondary to the job of being the eyes, the ears, the sword and the shield of the people. And um, I'm, I will finish off by, by using a case example of what we, are about, what we are currently doing and about to do in the Ukraine. Um, this is also difficult to read graphs. So you're going to have to take my word for it when I tell you what it says. Um, this shows a distribution of, um, of <coughs> degrees of parliamentary autonomy and, and parliamentary power and levels of corruption. Um, now clearly, at each area, each constitutional arrangement, there is very wide variation. For example, there are um, relatively honest uh, presidential republics and there are highly corrupt presidential republics. Nevertheless, averaging over all of those systems, and we've used as a measure of corruption the Transparency International's Corruption Perception Index, there is clearly and unambiguously a correlation between stronger parliaments and less corruption. The most corrupt countries in the world are countries where parliamentarians play little or no role in restraining government. The most corrupt countries in the world are the ones where parliamentarians either cannot or will not exercise restraint over the executive. The one area where I, I should point out that is an outlier, and I cannot explain, is in absolutist monar monarchies where parliamentarians typically have virtually no power and yet, re yet report less corruption than one, one would expect. I suspect that is because the, per the perception of what constitutes corruption in an absolutist mon monarchy is different from in a, in a functioning democracy. If you are the subject of a king, you are his property and everything you own is his property and I suppose that would change um, your perception of what it means to steal from you. In terms of, um, as an example, what we are doing in the Ukraine, um, one of our most active chapters, even before the fall of the, um, of, of the last elected government, was Go Pack Ukraine. Um, they were very active in um, trying to restrain corruption in the presidential administration and especially active in fighting corruption in the petrochemical and pharmaceutical industries. Um, there are many reasons why that government collapsed. Um, ethnic tensions between Russian and Ukrainians or Russian-speaking and Ukrainian-speaking peoples. Um, tensions between uh, rural and urban Ukraine, tensions between the East and West. But I think it is fair to say that those tensions were made most, most material 
in the revulsion the Ukrainians felt to the level of corruption in the presidential administration. In many ways, the uprising, although it had many, many sources and many consequences, was primarily an uprising against presidential corruption. The challenge of the Ukraine is that, bluntly, many of the people who are now competing to fill the vacuum um, left by that administration are at least as corrupt as the president who's been, been pulled down. And the risk for the Ukraine is quite likely, an, is quite literally an existentialist threat. A hundred people died in the uprising. Uh, there were billions of dollars lost in destroyed property. Um, the integrity of, of their state has been diminished by Crimea peeling off and other, other parts of the country peeling, uh, threatening to peel off. They have paid a very, very heavy price for the chance to have an honest government. If they do not succeed in getting an honest government, then I do not believe the Ukraine will survive as a country. Um, people who have lost, uh, lost their husbands, their wives, their brothers, their sisters, their children to an uprising and feel, who feel that they have paid a price not just in treasure but in blood for, the, for hope and yet feel that that hope is disappointed are people who are not going to take that risk a second time. More importantly, they are people who are not going to believe that those, the institutions that they have fought and in some cases died for can be resuscitated or can be reformed. The work that we are currently undertaking with our colleagues in the Ukraine, therefore, have five broad objectives. The first is the management of public expectations. Um, taking the Arab Spring countries, where we also have national chapters, as an example, um, it is monumentally difficult to manage public expectations in the aftermath of, of a revolution. People feel that they've, they've pulled down a tyrant and now justice are, has arrived. Justice takes a long time to get there. Um, and trying to persuade people not to lose faith, but also persuading people to engage in the difficult business of rebuilding is a task that many of the Arab Spring countries, such as Egypt, have failed to achieve. Um, but unlike most of those countries, they have a sufficient, most of those countries have a sufficiently, or many of those countries, have a sufficiently strong national identity that they can carry on even as successive governments fall apart. I'm not convinced that that is the case with Ukraine. Um, the second area is in immediate stabilization. Uh, we are working with our parliamentarians to try to identify, and will be working further to try to identify activities that they can do to try to halt the hemorrhaging, both financial and political, politically in the country. Um, they are balancing on a fiscal knife edge um, because of the debts that have been left behind by the previous government, because of the demands for payments um, from, the, from their neighbors to the east, and because of the uncertainty created, the economic uncertainty created as a result of the, re this re the revolution. If the situation is not stabilized, um, the summer will be difficult, the winter will be catastrophic. The third is rebuilding parliament. Um, no one likes to admit it, but the truth is, the corrupt regime that preceded the revolution was a product of the political system. If the political system does not change, it will simply replicate uh, corruption. Therefore, we need to work with them to set in, set in place a series of laws, regulations, and constitutional changes that at least makes it less likely that the next generation of politicians will steal, or if they steal, that they will steal less money. Um, thirdly, prosecutions. Um, many of the, friend, of the friends of the regime are um, enjoying high standards of living around the world, not just in, for, in Eastern countries, but also in Western countries, it is important that they be brought to justice. And lastly, asset, stolen asset recovery. Um, there are literally billions of dollars that have been siphoned out of the Ukraine that the people want back. They have every right to want, back, want it back. Again, taking the Arab Spring as an example, um, the Arab Spring countries managed to recover roughly one-tenth of one percent of the assets that were stolen by their form, former regimes, and that's not counting the legal fees that they paid to do that. Um, it is a difficult thing for people to realize that, that stolen money is gone. In many cases, it is, but if only to, if only to maintain public hope and public trust, they must, be, they must be satisfied that either the money has been returned or every possible step has been taken to try to, to, try to recover it. Our uh, chapter in the Ukraine will be holding its first major summit on these, su on these subjects on the 24th of April. Um, we will be working with them throughout the summer. My own sense is that we have two milestones that, by which we need to make significant progress on these subjects. 
The first is in time for the presidential elections, which are coming up this spring. And the next is the parliamentary elections, which are coming up in the autumn. Um, I'm not saying that we, are that they or we are going to solve these problems by then, but there must at least be enough momentum in that direction that the country has a fighting chance to make it through. Um, the next area is on international prosecutions. Okay. Um, just to, uh, without going over the numbers that I presented previously, um, one figure that often remains in my mind is the estimate that each year about 140,000 children are killed as a result of corruption by being deprived of food, water, and medical care. Um, it is one of the great shames, and it is of, of our time, and I think it's important to bear this in mind to realize that, again, there is a desperate human cost to corruption. If there were an individual who dropped a bomb or ordered an army to march and killed that many people, none of us would have any hesitation in, in saying that, that person had committed a crime against humanity. I see no reason why we, we would be any more forgiving for people who kill through theft and through plunder instead of through, uh, through bombs and bullets. As a result, uh, my colleagues and I are working on a, what is for us a major initiative to try to bring the most serious offenders to justice. Our view is that there are some forms of political corruption whose effects on human rights and human welfare are so catastrophic that they should shock the conscience of the international community and mobilize the will of nations to act, act across borders. Too often, the very worst perpetrators are able to use their illicit wealth and power to pervert the very laws and institutions that should be calling them to justice. And we believe that where national institutions are incapable or unwilling to bring those individuals to justice, then there is an obligation for international actors and the international community to act, to apprehend, try, um, convict if wanted, and sentence if convicted, the, those who commit the most serious acts of corruption, which we refer to as grand corruption. Towards this end, uh, in, to, in last year, 2013, our organization convened a meeting in Manila, in the Philippines, at the very beginning of the year. Um, called uncreatively the Manila Conference. conference. Um, it attracted 700 lawmakers from 78 countries and 12 um, heads of parliament, in other words, speakers of the house or secretary generals of the house where, the, where that is the, uh, the office. It was the largest anti-corruption gathering of parliamentarians in history and they approved in principle, amongst other decisions, um, our declaration that grand corruption should be a crime at international law. We brought parliamentarians together a second time at the Forum of Parliamentarians to the Conference of States Parties to the, to the UN Convention Against Corruption. It's a very long sentence. Um, the UN Convention Against Corruption is the major international treaty which deals with standard states are required to meet to fight corruption and the help they are required to give one another in the prosecution of corruption. And at that, um, at that meeting in December of last year, our, the assembled parliamentarians uh, unanimously um, adopted the GOPAC Declaration on International Prosecutions of Grand Corruption. It's a long declaration. If you're interested in the full text, it is at our website. But the part that I will um, point to is this one. Um, that we resolve to encourage states, the UN, and international institutions to deem crimes of grand corruption as crimes against the common community of humanity in violation of peremptory norms and international laws. What does that mean? That means that if you commit grand corruption, and defining what grand corruption is, is one of our major challenges, but if you commit an act of grand corruption, then there is nowhere in the world that you should be able to hide. The question now is, how do we give effect to this? We have five measures that were described in that resolution, and the work that um, GOPAC is pursuing at a global level and on a national level um, touches upon all five of those, and I'll pass over them very quickly. The first is the establishment of grand corruption under universal jurisdiction. Essentially, universal jurisdiction means that there are certain crimes that are so outrageous that it is both the right and the responsibility of countries everywhere to prosecute those crimes, even if those crimes did not happen on their soil. The classic case is of war crimes. If you commit a war crime, if you are a citizen of country A, you commit a war crime in country B, 
and you decide to retire to your villa in country C, country C has an obligation to arrest you and put you on trial for what you did. Um, and we believe that, the, that certain forms of corruption, people stealing billions of dollars, people raiding um, the healthcare budget or raiding the, um, the vaccination budget so that people die of massive plagues because there's no money to, vac to vaccinate them, certainly falls under this category. The, weakness of the strength of universal jurisdiction is that any country can pass a law, its national parliament can pass a law to assert universal jurisdiction over crimes. Um, and the best, perhaps the best known example was the effort by the government of Spain or the courts of Spain to prosecute, prosecute Augusto Pinochet for his crimes in Chile. Um, there is also um, a significant precedent, 78 countries across the world already assert universal jurisdiction over war crimes or over other crimes such as the sexual exploitation of children. The great weakness of universal jurisdiction is that it is honored more in word than in deed. There have only been, it's only, there are only 15 countries that have ever applied their laws, even though 78 have such laws, and its, its reach often exceeds its grasp. Um, Pinochet was, um, a warrant for his arrest was issued by the a Spanish court. Um, it was served in the United Kingdom. He should have been taken back to Spain uh, for trial, but the government of the United Kingdom lost its nerve and suddenly discovered that he was too ill to stand trial and let him go home to Chile. Nevertheless, it is the um, not easy, but easiest approach. The second is through the use of regional courts. Um, these are well established in Africa, Europe, and Latin America. Um, essentially, these are courts over certain hemis hemispheres or groups of nations to which groups of nations have subscribed. Um, one of the great strengths of using regional courts to prosecute grand corruption is that they exist, they function, and in general, they are well regarded. In addition, there is some precedent for, for bringing people for, uh, up on charges of grand corruption at regional courts, such as the um, economic community of West African states. Uh, this, the weakness of regional courts is that they are often toothless. 60% um, of the cases of that court have been, or decisions of that court have gone unenforced, um, and most of the world's population is not covered by regional courts. Uh, the next op option that we're also pursuing is through the International Criminal Court. The ICC is undoubtedly one of the great romantic symbols of world justice. The idea of there being a single global court of ultimate appeal um, is an idea that I think appeals to anyone with a yearning for justice. The idea that there is a court that will speak for, for people across the world. The reality of the, the ICC, though, is much more prosaic. In the 12 years of its existence, it has only convicted two people. Um, it is massively overburdened and massively under-resourced. Um, I am skeptical about whether it has the ability to take on additional um, responsibilities, given its, its struggle with its um, current responsibilities. And the Rome Statute, which governs um, the, the court, does not make any explicit mention to, to corruption being under its jurisdiction. Um, Next is a declaration of, of grand corruption as being a crime against humanity. The parliamentarians who, from across the world who met um, in Panama City in December 2013 and who were called together by GOPAC did vote unanimously to say that grand corruption, once it passes a certain threshold, is a crime against humanity. Um, I'm very proud of that decision and very proud of the fact that that decision was adopted by parliamentarians who come not only from different countries, but from countries that have long and bitter histories of disagreeing on absolutely everything. Um, it included uh, parliamentarians from Russia and Ukraine, parliamentarians from Iraq and Iran, parliamentarians from Sudan and South Sudan, parliamentarians from Armenia and Turkey. Um, but the question of applying a crime, applying um, existing international law on crimes against humanity to corruption is a delicate one, to put it lightly. Um, grand corruption certainly meets one, one of the criteria, that is, it causes great suffering or serious injury to body or to mental or physical health. It rarely meets the other criteria, or another criteria, that it is part of a systematic, part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against a civilian population with an intent 
to eventually destroy part of a population. Typically, um, people who commit grand corruption aren't trying to kill people, they just don't care that they're killing people. And finally, civil remedies, um, which really appeals to my colleagues in the United States because it's all about suing people. Um, in essence, the idea here is that uh, people who are guilty of crime or have committed acts of crime corruption can be pursued through civil actions um, that are designed to make their victims whole by recovering the funds and also designed to punish them by taking the funds away from them. It's often much easier to pursue um, the stolen money than to pursue the person who has stolen the money. On the one hand, it makes it possible to, to try crime or to go after uh, such people in many jurisdictions across the world. On the downside, it is very expensive. Um, and to take New York State as an example, 98% of the lawsuits launched in that jurisdiction never go to trial. Um, settling with a conventional case is difficult. The ethics of settling with a dictator are difficult to imagine. Nevertheless, we are, um, this is another of the, the, um, another of the areas that we are pursuing. I cannot tell you who we're going after, but we have a couple of people in our sights. Um, we are pursuing all of, these, all of these approaches in tandem. All of them have their strengths. All of them have their weaknesses. None of them is perfect. But ultimately, the, the test for all of us, not just for members of, of GOPAC, but for all of us as individuals, is the question of not making tomorrow perfect, but making tomorrow better. I think few people realize how much harm is caused by corruption. There has never been a war in human history that has killed as many people as political corruption. There has never been a weapon designed that could kill as many people as have died already as a result of political corruption. And the fact that this is a silent carnage doesn't mean that it's any less of a carnage. For the people who are, who are members of GOPAC, we feel that this is our calling, um, but we also recognize that this is, that this is an uphill battle. And the most difficult part of fighting corruption is the massive amount of public cynicism over whether or not such a battle is possible um, to be waged, let alone won. The appeal I would make to everyone in this room is the same appeal I would make to everyone I have speak to around the world, and that is cynicism is the despot's best friend. Everyone who commits an act of grand corruption wants us to be cynical. They want us to believe that nothing can be done so that we do nothing. But if there's anything that I have learned during my, the course of my time as professional head of GOPAC, it is that the despots we have in, encountered, they really do go to bed every night asking themselves, is tonight the night when my people will decide they've had enough? Is tonight the night when the public square is going to erupt in protest and in flame? Is tonight the night that I'm going to be called to account? The only reason people get away with it is because political systems have developed that let them get away with it. By the same token, they can't get away with it if we don't let them get away with it. And for all of us as citizens, or as parliamentarians, or as just as individual human beings, we have an obligation to ensure that they don't get away with it. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, very much for that, uh, Akash. It's a uh, very sobering <clears throat> uh, assessment presentation. Both presentations were uh, very sobering. Um, I'm sure many of us uh, came here um, expecting to hear that there were enormous challenges to corruption worldwide, but to have them laid out in the kind of detail and in and brought home in the kinds of examples that uh, you've given us uh, makes us much more conscious of the enormity of the challenges. So uh, thank you and let's now uh, go to the floor uh, for questions from uh, people who uh, may have questions. Um, Please go to the microphone over here so, the, uh, so that what you say will uh, be recorded. And please give your name and affiliation so our panelists will have more context to deal with the question. <clears throat> 
thank you uh, for the interesting presentation. My name is Goldbon. I'm a PhD student at the University of Ottawa. So my affiliation would be I'm a student member of CIC. Uh, my question, and I'm hoping that I can uh, articulate it in a way that is uh, understood well, um, I was wondering how universal jurisdiction, or in general, GOPAC, will have an overlook in uh, um, when corruption launches itself to the militia or armed forces. I'm pretty sure you're aware of the massive increase in the civil uprisings. So armed forces and the militia being the only or eventually the only force to have control over the people's uprising, the peoples who you said are, are fed up with the political uh, corruption or, or politically corrupted systems. Thank you. Akash? Okay. That's a very good question. Um, and you're right, often in the anarchy that follows an uprising, the only institution that is left standing or left in control of itself and with the hope of controlling the situation is the, is the military. And often the military is as corrupt as the political masters um, against whom the uprising has happened. Um, I will give you an example of where it works well and an example of where it works poorly. And oddly enough, both examples are the same country. Um, in Egypt, when they initially had their uprising, the reason it was relatively bloodless was because the army refused to open fire on the people. Um, and then subsequently, the army has now basically taken control of the country. Um, I, well, I'm thinking about the best way of putting this. Um, it's important, therefore, if you have a situation prior to um, prior to an uprising, it's desperately important that Parliament assert civilian control over the armed forces, even if there is a corrupt government. And there is no government that is free of corruption. In all of our chapters, we do emphasize the absolute imperative for Parliament to have oversight and the state to have control, the civilian state to have, have control of, over the armed forces, because when it does come to it, you don't, you don't want the people with guns to be, the, to be out of control. Um, the second area, though, to be, I think, that has been brought home to me, especially in, during the Arab Spring uprising, is one of the reasons why the military has become so powerful. In Egypt, it wasn't just because um, they had all the guns, but in addition, because there was an opportunity in the military under the previous government for people of intelligence and talent to find a career. In other words, if you live in a country where all the, st all the organs of state are controlled by the president and his or her family, uh, or by a specific caste, a specific ethnicity, or a specific um, group of people from a given faith, often the military is the only place where people find something approaching a meritocracy. And that's, that's what happened, I, what I believe happened in, in Egypt. So from that perspective, I think the other thing is that, that states before an uprising have to bear in mind is that if you see all of the talent in your society going into the military, that's not a situation that's going to last very long. Um, after the up uprising happens, um, I guess the other thing I, I would point out, another example would be Libya. Um, Libya fell apart as it fell apart under, under Gaddafi. Um, that military was made up entirely or largely, significantly, of paid mercenaries. And it's one of the reasons why Gaddafi lost control of the country very quickly. Um, by contrast, in Syria, that's a country where the military was made up of members of the local population, and especially members, members of a particular group that were attached to the president. Um, so from that perspective, I would say that people who are involved in orchestrating uh, an uprising, or involved in part of an uprising, have to do whatever they can to win over the armed forces. Um, the last thing, what does the world need to do about it? Um, I do believe that there are more, there, there's no appetite in Western countries especially for military intervention these days. Uh, but I do believe that there is, a, uh, there is a role to play and there is an obligation for countries outside of the area at least to provide minimum cover to people in those countries. Um, at, at like a no-fly zone that was imposed in Libya. Um, the truth is, in the Ukraine is an interesting case, no one is going to go to war with Putin. Absolutely no one is going to go to war with Putin over the Ukraine, and no one is going to risk war with Putin over, over Ukraine. Uh, 
and it will be up to the people of, U of the Ukraine to try to rebuild an armed forces that's, that's capable of defending their country. Um, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Okay. Susan, do you have anything to add? No, that was <coughs> I, I agree. <laughs> yes, a very difficult situation, mm -hmm. certainly in the Ukraine. Just uh, one comment on the military, for example, in Egypt and in many countries, they tend to control a large part of the economy as well. They are the most organized and, uh, as, as you say, um, they're a meritocracy. They're also uh, uh, plugged very much into uh, economic production and the means of production, particularly, uh, mm -hmm. I think, in Egypt, it's uh, 60 or 70 percent of the economy is right. controlled. Uh, by the military. They own the companies, they own the means of production, they own the suppliers, uh, and so on. Um, so it's an additional huge hurdle when you look at the power structures in a country uh, like Egypt to be able to overcome uh, the elements of corruption. Yes. John. Hi there, my name is uh, John Burnett. I know we spoke earlier. I'm a lawyer with the uh, Department of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, here. Um, as an international community, uh, obviously we're faced with the challenge of sovereignty uh, in terms of what can the international community do in terms of intervening um, in, in the affairs of other countries. Um, I think you laid out a very strong case in terms of the some of the judicial tools that could be applied, uh, but obviously they, uh, aspects such as applying universal jurisdiction will tend to be for the most extreme or the most heinous cases. Um, what are other tools uh, that can be applied um, from the international community perspective in terms of combating corruption, uh, even you know below the head of state level or, or in the day-to-day -day affairs? Um, you know we've seen different types of approaches, uh, incentives, for example, to leaders or others who, you know, leave power uh, without having looted their governments. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a, a, a well-known example. Um, should there be demands for governments giving aid in terms of greater accountability for those flows of finances, uh, sunshine in terms of uh, media um, reporting? Uh, can you speak a bit more to some of the additional tools that, that, that we in the international community can can bring to bear uh, to address this this problem. Thank you. Um, one one dimension that is um, worth noting are the uh, the sanctions that are uh, brought forward by uh, multinational international institutions. The uh, the World Bank, for example, has a uh, well. It's like a blacklist. Um, and there are several uh, Canadian companies that now find themselves on that list um, where it means that they will not be entitled to receive any f to receive further contracts for work for work abroad um, and that and that you know they, they're put on that list for varying lengths of time and can um, redeem themselves by t going through a whole series of concrete steps. Um, I think as well the, uh, the element of the sunshine element, as, as you put it, is, should not be overlooked. I mean, it's a soft tool, but it's one that um, frequently can be used in, in conjunction with a population who, when they see the way that their country is being referred to and how their how their country is doing compared to others in terms of corruption it can then further stimulate and um, their actions um, I would agree that I, I'd also say that um, probably the most important thing for us to bear in mind especially for the, those of uh, those those of us in this room who have an interest in international affair affairs is to have the humility to to admit to understand that no one can make a people free, only people can free themselves. Um, and that is why the model that GOPAC follows is um, we support national legislators in bringing about changes within their own countries. We typically don't go seeding national chapters either. We wait for legislators to come to us because our sense is that unless they are themselves willing, able, and prepared to take that step, um, we, you can't help someone who, does not, who is not in the mindset or in the place to want to or to be able to accept that help. 
But having said that, um, there's a great deal that when there is that is that appetite that has germinated within a population. There's a great deal that the international community can do to nurture it. Partly, um, I, I, if there were only one thing that, that could be done, I would have to say it would be nurturing and supporting a free press. Um, and that is easier today than it has been for previous generations because of instantaneous communications. Um, the more people know, the more likely they are to be outraged by the acts committed against them, and outrage does lead to change. The second aspect is in supporting democratic institutions, um, capacity building both for parliament, um, the bureaucracy especially, um, and law enforcement. Um, there are many organizations that have, we work specifically with parliamentarians, there are many organizations that work with courts, with lawyers, um, with police forces. It's very, very important for people in, who are struggling against corruption to know that there is another way and that there are people outside of their borders who are prepared to, to assist them and to stand by them and critically, who are prepared to make noise if they disappear. Um, from a domestic perspective within our own countries, um, I think Canadians can be proud of the Corruption of Foreign Officials Act. I think uh, that um, it's important to bear in mind that corruption knows no borders, especially large-scale corruption. And corruption in the developing world is possible only because it's enabled by actors in many other countries, including the developed world. Therefore, laws that are passed in our own country to criminalize giving and asking and or receiving of bribes or participation in illicit activities by companies and individuals based here does pay dividends in the countries where they would be active and where they would, where they would fuel that. And, um, and lastly, I would say through um, rigorous monitoring of anti-money laundering provisions. Um, if you're going to steal large amounts of money from your country, the first thing you want to do is get it out of your country so that no one can get their hands on it. And that means typically um, sending it to a bank in Dubai, in the Cayman Islands, in Switzerland, um, and in other developed countries. Uh, the, and every time money crosses a border, it becomes more obscure. But every time it crosses a border, it also gives it an opportunity for international actors to do something about it. Thanks very much. So our last question. Uh, Louise Terrio Mackay, I'm a longtime member of the CIC. Uh, I was very, very impressed and I must say very disturbed uh, by much of what was said, especially the statistics and the amount of money uh, that uh, goes into corruption and the lives that are touched by it. I realize uh, that uh, the discussion tonight uh, concentrated mostly on uh, large scale. Uh, corruption of governments and so on, and we didn't touch upon uh, the, let's say, the corruption of, of companies uh, of, and I'll use the example of mining companies, for instance, uh, paying bribes or uh, of the example in Libya of getting contracts uh, through bribes, um, and uh, using again the example uh, of uh, the Ukraine. I remember uh, reading an article where it wasn't only the government uh, that uh, had so much corruption, uh, but even some poor woman who wanted to go to a doctor and in order to have an appointment at the doctors, uh, she had to give a bribe. Uh, in other words, it is so much part of the culture in so many countries that, I mean, how, how can you combat this this mentality uh, of corruption, uh, or, or I use another example, for instance, I remember some years ago, someone mentioning that uh, uh, in Indonesia, uh, some of the, uh, the public servants who, when they, well, not even diplomats, who when they came back to the country because uh, uh, their salaries were so much lower, uh, they had to, in other words, uh, try to find ways uh, to, to compensate. And so I wonder if you could uh, perhaps comment a bit on that. Well, the, um, <clears throat> it's, an important, it's an important dimension and the link between the levels of pay uh, the, for, for, for public officials, particularly uh, junior public officials and the the need and often the expectation that they will supp supplement their um, clearly inadequate salaries by uh, innovative means. 
say, um, is, is, uh, is, is well recognized. And it's very difficult to know how that can be addressed. But there are some interesting efforts being made, and I, I don't mean to trivialize it, but I thought this was a particularly interesting example of, um, well, let me say two things. Um, increasingly, there are, there's training being presented to those who go abroad um, of how to respond to the expectation that you are going to come across with a, an extra $25 before you'll get your documentation approved at the, at the airport and this sort of thing. Um, increasingly, um, there are a number of companies from different, from different countries where people are starting to say, well, I can't give you that because I'm Belgian. And that that there's a, a, gradually there's a sort of you can you can that you can hide behind um, a, a, a national sanction or something like that. But on a separate subject, one of the stories that I heard recently about an attempt in and this was in Mexico um, to try and address the the knowledge that um, there was widespread uh, corruption petty level corruption by police officers who would stop someone and then demand a payment in order to not give a ticket. Um, there was a, an app developed, the municipal government developed an app where people could click on where they were at the moment that this had just happened to them. And usually what people would do would be to pay the, the, the amount in order to not get a ticket. So you would clip, click on this app that was called I Just, Play, I Just Paid a Bribe. And, <clears throat> and they, these were all collected and then charted so that it was possible to then look at the map of the city and see where there were an unusually large number of bribes being paid and to see who was on duty mm -hmm. at those corners at that time in order to try and address it. So just in a, a You mean people actually uh, would report themselves and pay a bigger ticket than the bribe? No, they would just, they wouldn't report themselves. They would just anonymously say, I just paid oh, a bribe okay. at this, at the, <laughs> I just paid a bribe at this intersection. Excellent. <laughs> mm. I've, I, I think Susan's example is, is an apt one because one of the, looking at, at low level corruption, um, often exposing it to the light of day is, is usually the best way of doing that. There are apps like the one Susan described, that's probably the best known one. There are also um, organizations, uh, local organizations in India, there's one called Fifth Pillar. And one of the things that they do is anytime someone is asked for a bribe before he or she receives a public service, um, if they go to this organization, the organization will contact the, the entity, the government agency, and say, we're calling from Fifth Pillar. Is it the case that this person can't get his rations unless he pays a bribe? And it, it disappears very quickly. Um, but I think that there is also a, a significant connection between low-level corruption and high-level corruption. Mm -hmm. I have never known a country a where, um, where there was a culture of corruption at the street level where it was not connected to corruption in the highest offices of state. And a, it is po fighting corruption at the top always um, trickles down to, to the people on the street. Um, in addition to that, um, in the middle, as it were, is the area of, um, of corruption in, in government payments uh, to individuals through social payments and the like. Brazil has, a, I think, a fantastically interesting model where some of our colleagues from Gopak Brazil have collaborated on um, a website that was created, that they've created, or the government has created, um, that publishes every check that the government of Brazil issues in any amount. Um, so, and if you are in receipt of public assistance, um, you can go. If you live in, in a village, you can go and look up who in your community is in is receiving what money from the government, be it contracts all the way down to public assistance. In a country like Canada, we would have significant concerns about privacy. I think it's fair to say that in Brazil, people are more concerned about corruption and have, have embraced this. And it has had a significant effect, um, either at the highest level or at the lowest level. Um, corruption breeds in the dark and it withers before the glare of public scrutiny.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're out, out of time, uh, but uh, I would appreciate very much if uh, Chris Tan, uh, one of our board members, uh, would come up and thank the, uh, the panelists. Um, I, I would remind you that uh, our a, a, a video uh, of this event is available on the national website, opencanada.org, and that uh, under the, uh, the branch um, area of the website, we will also have the presentations that were made tonight available if you wish to follow up or uh, conduct further research in the area. And of course, you can always go to the uh, GOPAC website as well as the uh, Transparency International website, which uh, w uh, have uh, significant information to follow up. Chris? Thanks, Harold. Sorry, Randolph. Randolph has a very unique name. It's Randolph Harold. So I always get mixed up and I call him Harold, but I think he understands. It's been done before. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Not to worry, we're still going to be eating. Uh, if, we're going to, if we're going to miss the hotel food, we can certainly order out for pizza. Okay? But I think running over time really is a reflection of the uh, interesting topic that we've had tonight. Uh, it, it's just a fascinating topic on a subject matter that uh, I think it's very central to those people are, that are interested in international relations and also in our own domestic national affairs at this time. Um, on behalf of the uh, CIC uh, and the guests here tonight, uh, I'd like to thank Susan and Akash for their very insightful presentation on your respective organizations. Uh, you, you've given us a, a very good uh, perspective into your, your workings uh, in, in terms of identification, classification, um, enforcement uh, of, of corruption throughout the world and in fact in your nation building efforts throughout the world and, and, the, uh, and the difficulties in enforcing uh, uh, the perpetrators uh, involved in this, uh, in this pervasive uh, issue throughout the world. I think I'll be honest, when I heard of TI, GOPAC, I probably knew a little bit more about TI, but GOPAC, I, I really didn't know about it and, and I'm really ashamed of that. And I, but I think a lot of people out there probably didn't have that direct knowledge of your two, uh, two organizations. But I think it's been wonderful that you uh, enlightens, enlightens us on that, and especially myself. Um, but I think corruption is not only a pervasive issue throughout the world, I, I think it's one that we could never get rid of. I, I think th this goes to your practical idealism, and I think that's a very realistic way of, of approaching this. There's no cure-all, there's no panacea that can eradicate all, all the forms of corruption out there. Uh, I'll share with you, uh, uh, however, you should keep up your optimism and, and not cynicism. Uh, I might date myself here, but uh, not, well, I think a long time ago at, at a reputable international affairs school in town, I remember reading my first text on political development, and uh, when, um, when Randolph asked me to do this, for some reason it triggered that article that I read. It was on political corruption, but it was a positive spin to it. It, it was telling, it, it, of course, pro political corruption was bad, uh, per se, but it was saying, yes, there are efficiencies you can you can get out of corruption. Uh, you, 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 grease that, uh, you, you grease that wheel, you make things work. Uh, however, uh, two things I'd like to comment on that. Uh, one is going to Louise's comment about business and, uh, and, and the, the uh, longstanding attitudes that are pre pre prevalent throughout the world. And, and that was recently at a Aga Khan uh, Pluralism Center uh, presentation on Kenya. There was a question asked uh, to a panelist of uh, experts who had been involved in the recent new constitution in Kenya two, two three years ago. And the question was very straightforward, like Louise's. It, it, how is transparency or lack of it uh, happening in, in Kenya in terms of business? And 
And almost automatically, the, the panelists say, well, I think it, to paraphrase, they were saying, what are you talking about? Uh, in Kenya, the system is a given. It's administered by the government that there, that there are certain th processes and procedures that are done, and you really can't, uh, you can't uh, make inroads in, into that established system. But nevertheless, there's a new constitution in Kenya, and, and the aspiration is to, to reform. But to... Uh, to, sh to, sh uh, to conclude, I, I think we'd like to provide you with all the optimism that we can give you and, and not cynicism in, in terms of uh, all your efforts throughout the world in, in terms of uh, reducing, but perhaps not eradicating corruption at this time. Thank you very much again for coming. Thank you. Dinner will be served shortly.